Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Haidea Institute online lecture series. Um, thank you so much, Tatiana Burr, for being here. Dr. Tatiana Burr is a lecturer in classics at the Australian National University. She was the Moses and Mary Finley Research Fellow at Darwin College, University of Cambridge, where she completed her PhD and is a graduate of the University of Sydney, where she completed undergraduate and master's studies. A cultural historian of technology and religion, Dr. Burr has published on various topics, such as the religious uses of mirror reflections, ancient pneumatics, technical animation, technological animation in classical antiquity, and most recently on the depiction of the Antikythera in the new Indiana Jones movie. Her upcoming book, Technologies of the Marvelous in Ancient Greek Religion, is an investigation into the ways that technological and especially mechanical strategies were integrated into ancient Greek religion and the epistemological and religious implications of these interactions between gods, worshipers, and machines. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Megan. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Thanks everybody for joining me on your Thursday evening, uh, my Friday morning here down under. Um, as Megan was just introducing my forthcoming book, my first mon monograph is about the interactions between tech and religion in antiquity, and that is actually going to be the topic of the talk today. So it's a sort of um, summary of the book and then giving you a few case studies from the book. Um, and I do still have time to take in feedback, so I'd be really grateful to hear your thoughts at the end. I look forward to discussing with everybody. Okay, um, you can we can see the screen, can't we? I believe. Okay, good. So, creationism dictates, in its broadest sense, that God made man. But how does man make God? How do humans make their supernatural entities present in the mortal world? The ancient Greeks were fashioning and refashioning their deities all the time in efforts to make their gods present. This happened through language, so through things like invocation, prayer, uh, song, but also things like curses. Um, this happened through actions, so through the rituals of, for example, sacrifice or dedication or procession. And this also happened through objects, so through statues, through votives, through temples themselves, through the natural landscape. Um, and the premise of the book is, is quite simply that the picture remains incomplete. Uh, and I seek to introduce the technological as another mode of visual epiphany in ancient Greek religion. So the end goal of a sacred image, we might say, is to solve the problem of divine presence, how to make the divine present. And this goal is not so different in the end as that of the deus ex machina or of the processional automaton or an oracular autophone. The latter, however, are examples of a specific subset of religious objects which rely on technological strategies to achieve this end goal. And so the cognitive challenges that viewing religious technologies entailed and the epistemological problems that the construction and the deployment of these objects pose are quite unique. The second claim then that the book is trying to make is that actually the relationship between the technical and the miraculous in, ancient, in the ancient Greek world was characterized by dialogue rather than conflict. And in this, the book tries to advocate for a kind of shift in how we think about the constructions of scientific and religious bodies of knowledge and Greco-Roman antiquity. So I'll start by giving, oh, if I can, I'll just try and move the slide along, a little um, overview of the book. And then obviously I've had to just choose a few case studies. So we're, we're going to be quite selective in what follows. So the book is divided up into three parts. And the first part, um, Greek tragedy and mechanical epiphany, is based around a single really well-known object from antiquity. That is the theatrical crane or the mechane. And I think about how the crane um, 
works as a visually intrusive piece of stage machinery and how this fits with other religious objects, including its sister object of the comic crane. I think about the Mehene more broadly within the context of an ancient festival. And I think about um, the, and then I, I, sorry, I go through the use of the Mehene in three, uh, in six separate places. I see in the tragic Mekane the an early model of the interaction between technology and religion, which importantly predates the uh, Hellenistic period and the formal development of the discipline of mechanics. In part two, technologies and ritual experience, I look at how technologies were used in different ritual contexts from divination and dedication to procession, as well as in general to enhance the, the temple space. If part one is restricted to one particular mechanism and one particular cultural form, part two is a real flight of fancy. Uh, ancient evidence in this second part fly, uh, spans from archaic votives to Homeric epics to technical manuals to Hellenistic epigram to automata. One of the things that comes out from the breadth of evidence is the way that with the passing of time, uh, there is an increase in the degree of independent interest in the mechanism, qua mechanism, and crucially then in the theological and the political potential of the mechanism. Part three, faking the gods, um, is grounded then in an imperial Greek context. I use two dialogues of Lucian, the Alexander and the Icaromenopus, to explore what happens when technology is no longer put to the service of religion, but instead the phenomenon of technologically manufacturing the marvelous holds potential actually to threaten the religious order. So before jumping into the case studies from those, those parts, I'm just going to pull out one little thing from the introduction, which I think is worth mentioning at the beginning of the talk. And that is exactly what I mean when I say technology and actually how this word, into, as I use it, interacts with the emic category of mechanica or, the, you know, the Greek category of mechanica. So technology, as we use the term today, can refer to a physical object, so it is um, something that you can hold in your hand, a process, it can be seen in action, uh, and it's also a kind of knowledge. It describes a specific kind of, of scientific know-how. Thinking across these three components, uh, objects, processes, and knowledge, is key, I think, to bring together the material discursive and epistemic qualities of ancient technology. It points us um, in the right direction towards using a breadth of evidence that is material culture to unpack the material qualities, that is literature from poetry to history um, in the discursive, uh, un understanding the discursive qualities, um, and also a very specific subgenre of, of literature, and that is mechanical texts, to get to the heart of the specific epistemic qualities of these objects. Sorry to interrupt just one moment. I think you have to um, click slideshow for your slides to advance, because I think we're, at least on my end, we're still seeing the title slide. You're still seeing the title slide. That's a shame. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. <laughs> That's okay. What do I need to do, do you think? Um, probably click slideshow. I'm not sure. Hold on. Let's see. If you go to the bottom right corner of, yeah, there you go. Is it working now? Yes. Oh, okay. So this was the, <laughs> this was the content. And we went through the different parts. Um, there we go. And then we were here just talking about what technology is, the different qualities. Okay. Are we all back? Is that all better, Megan? It's, uh, it seems to be in presenter view. Um, what does that mean? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, hi, presenter view. Is that better? Perfect. There we go. Okay. We're back in action. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> All right. So I hope you were able to keep up with me despite the, the technological failure. Of course, that happens on a topic like this. Has to be the irony. Right. Things should be smoother from now on in. So we're talking about technology. 
So when we use the word technology, we uh, the word as we use it can relate um, as much to kind of uh, production and the economy, but uh, as it can relate to things like uh, entertainment and enchantment. And in this latter category are uh, the kinds of technologies to which the book actually pays the most attention. Incidentally, we know from um, ancient mathematicians that technologies of enchantment were actually a very real contemporary category of the ancient mechanical art. Um, and it's distinguished in antiquity as falling under the purview of thaumasiorgoi or wonder workers. This category has significant overlaps with art. So thinking in Greek terms, in fact, art and techne cannot be linguistically distinguished. The fact that artists in antiquity are quite literally technicians is important to demonstrate how much continuity there are between the realms of artistic production and technology in antiquity, foremost in the context of ancient religion. Both works of art and mechanical objects at times choose to efface their own procedures, technical procedures, whether these are simple or complex, and at other times are quite self-conscious about how they've come to exist. Yet products of mechanical and mathematical and scientific techni are also um, or have quite a unique relationship to the epistemic content that they embody. So in thinking actually about the distinction between art and science in antiquity, we should also put a little bit of emphasis on the fact that as epistemic things, technological objects are situated at the interface between the material and the conceptual aspects of science. The advent of the scientific lab and the formal development of experimental procedure is going to change the nature of epistemic things dramatically, but even in the ancient scientific context, I do think that it's fair to say that technological objects resembled reified theorems in ways that artworks do not. And this is actually why I, I feel that ancient technical manuals are so such a special um, genre for us to use and to get to the heart of what these objects are as epistemic things. Now, the term technologia in antiquity was not at all used in the way that I've described above. A much closer term would be mechanica, the science of mechanics, which, to judge from the sort of disparate bits of testimony that survive, um, was subdivided into topics including ballistics, siege machinery, lifting devices, pneumatics, and automata. Um, and I've given you on the right-hand side just some authors, they're the ones that I will speak about um, in the talk today, just to contextualize them chronologically. What comes out clearly in these kinds of texts is the way that mechanics has certain features. It is inherently man-made. It requires ingenuity and skills. It enables acts that are contrary to nature, and these solve human predicaments. It's embodied in a device that is called a mechane, and it's often counterintuitive in what it allows. Finally, it lies somewhere between theoretical mathematics and practical physics as a discipline. I would also emphasize, however, that mechanical objects existed before the formal discipline of mechanics. And that leads us to part one. The Deus ex machina appeared at the end of tragedies to solve all problems and guarantee that the action is complete, I quote the scholar there, or so holds the traditional view. The mechanical entrance of a deity has persistently been seen as a structural device used by tragic authors to help tidy up their plots, and as a result, the mechane has never really been taken seriously as an object which might have theological significance. To make matters worse, the mechane is considered clunky and inelegant as a piece of stage machinery, breaking the illusion desired by the tragic genre. Would have been a shame not to have that piece of clip art in there, right? I propose instead to think about how the deus ex machina functions as a form of visual epiphany. I try to show that actually the innate visibility of the mechane is integral to the theological work that the cultural device is performing. 
there are certain general comments that we can make about the mechanae, how it appears and how it works. And then there are specific uses in different plays, which, you know, toy with these and, and, uh, and, and, and um, appropriate these, these general features in various ways. So as best as we can reconstruct the mechanae, it was available for use in uh, the, by the late fifth century BC, and it was probably placed on a kind of base behind the scanae, um, constructed as an asymmetrical counterweighted beam with pivoting potential, and a sort of tread wheel used as an energy source. Um, when it rests, this is the, why I like um, masternodes drawings, when at rest, the mechanae probably would have been minimally visible since the bar would have lain horizontally. And then when in use, the mechanae would have come into use, uh, come into view rather, hovering uh, not over an artificial backdrop as we are familiar with, with stage production, but over the sky itself. And the crane would have been then able to pivot up to 180 degrees across the space in front um, of the scanae roof as certain plays seem to have required. Now, taking into consideration the performative conditions of fifth century Attic um, tragedy, spectators would undeniably have been able to see the, the beams and the ropes and the platform or the trapeze or whatever it was that con constituted the mechanism. So scholars of theatre have shown how it's the case that spectators watching dramatic performance are always aware that what they are seeing is both real and make-believe at the same time and that the audience can deal with this contradiction quite comfortably. Ancient tragedy had various intrusive features. Um, the tragic mask, for example, offers quite a useful parallel in this sense for the mechanae. Both are visualised in a way that is um, more nuanced than the binary of sort of real and artificial. And this is another way actually in which there's a lot of interpretative overlap between art and technology. Theatrical performance kind of bridges these two concepts really nicely. So art historians also point to the twofold nature of viewing ancient art, where both the entity represented in an image and its constructed status um, are, are recognised simultaneously. Similarly, the mechanics involved in the appearance of the god may have been obvious, but this did not stop it from being a manifestation of the, di of the divinity. The mechanae challenged its viewers both to recognise the epiphany alongside the mechanics that constructed it. Another feature of the mechanae is that it is by nature an epiphany with two audiences. So on the one hand, it's witnessed and it's experienced at the level of the characters in the play um, who react in a certain way to the moment of divine intervention. And on the other hand, it's a moment of staged epiphany by the audience watching the play. The internal and external audiences of the mechanical epiphany quite, speaks quite directly to other forms of visual epiphany in Greek culture. So let me exemplify everything that I've said with a sort of an example. So, view, sorry. Uh, this is the Arkanos relief from uh, Oropos. Um, within a single frame, and everything that I'm saying here has been beautifully demonstrated by wonderful scholars. Um, and I'm leaning on what they've said about reliefs in order to then understand the mechanism better. So within a different frame, uh, within a single frame rather, three different strategies of divine encounter are presented. In the background on the right-hand side of the relief is a worshiper praying. In the midground, a worshipper reclines in the manner typical of an incubation healing scene with a snake touching his shoulder. In the foreground and to the left of the image um, is an anthropomorphized Amphiaris who's healing the same shoulder of the worshipper. As scholars have noted, the relief essentially maps a network of religious experience where the related activities of prayer, theriomorphic epiphany, uh, in a dream and anthropomorphic physical epiphany are all presented as key components of an encounter with this god. At the same time, the relief refers through the votive pinax in the back uh, just above the reclined worshipper to the physical location of the sanctuary, um, thus signalling its own role as a religious medium, which offers another mode through which to connect the divine to the worshippers, this time 
con those concretely in the sanctuary at Oropos and external to the relief. So unlike the characters in the play or the figures on the relief, spectators in the theatre and viewers of the relief are not expected to, for example, show kind of physical reverence to the gods. But they're still supposed to recognise the epiphany as legitimate and any religious media involved as exerting a sense of divine agency. Now, this is just one example, but we can think of lots of other examples in Greek history of staged epiphanies. For example, the case, the very famous case of Phaia dressed as Athena, accompanying Pisistratus's triumphant return to power in Athens in 556 for 55 BCE. And how all these models already quite recognized in Greek religion fit rather comfortably with the mechanae as a form of divine epiphany. As well as looking generally at how the deus ex machina worked then, the book also looks at the mechanical mode of epiphany in situ in a few plays. So I group the plays loosely together in twos. Um, so the premise of the Helen, uh, Euripides' Helen, that essentially the real Helen is in Egypt rather than Troy, makes it as at its base level a play all about um, who's who and how you can tell. It uses the mechanae then to confirm uh, divine form in a play that's otherwise full of illusions. Concern for divine form is obviously also front um, and centre of the bacchae, where there's lots of issues of recognition and misrecognition. But in that instance, the mechanae is presented as yet another mode of epiphanic um, presence of the uh, mimetically in, um, inclined god of theatre. The Loctetes, uh, Sophocles is Loctetes, and Heracles, Euripides is Heracles, use the mechanae less to explore um, issues uh, of divine appearance and more to theorise issues of space and movement and connectedness of divine and mortal realms. So in the Philoctetes, the crane open up, opens up a vertical axis in the play for Heracles to be manifested before Philoctetes and serve it as a vision in which he himself is reflected. Um, this is a play otherwise that is very shut off, right? It's, it's you know, on a deserted island of Lemnos with only one of the Aesidoi in, in action. In Heracles, the crane creates a sort of isolated bubble of sacred, of, of, of unattached liminal space for the, the two goddesses, Iris and Lisa, to debate the justice of divine intervention. And finally, um, the Orestes and the Medea are two plays which use the mechanae to foreground issues of ontology um, and the ontological boundaries actually between human and divine. This is quite evident in the Medea, where the title character is famously the only human to use the crane. And the deus ex machina scene in the Orestes is also used to explore what it means to be divine by intervening in a moment in the tragedy where things have escalated to having human characters actually already acting as divine agents from the rooftop, trying to orchestrate what's going on. And the mechanical epiphany is the kind of unequivocal divine intervention in a scene and in a world where humans are already trying to imitate gods. Ultimately, what I hope to show um, is that it's far more than a kind of bizarre theatrical anomaly. Uh, the, the mechanae offered an important cultural and religious precedent for mechanical epiphany. And that leads us into the next part, which kind of moves on chronologically as well. And that is technologies and ritual experience. So certain rituals characterize what we today think of as Greek religion, uh, sacrifice or prayer or dedication, cursing, libation, divination, procession. These all seek to connect with the divine in some way. And this part of the book discusses how technologies were incorporated into Greek religious rituals in order to render the supernatural tangible. In doing so, I aim at two things. The first is to uncover an archaeology of the phenomenon at hand, which is why I look at how 
scientific epistemology interacts with more simple religious objects, uh, sign, um, sorry, more simple religious objects like hinged figurines, which you can see on the screen, and wheels used in temples and on tripods, which look back to Hephaestus' self-animated tripods in the Iliad. But the second related claim of the chapter is that it's too simplistic to see Hellenistic automata purely as advertisements of scientific achievement by Hellenistic kings. And instead, I suggest that if Hellenistic kings were actually successfully adopting these technological media into their religious displays, it's because of the inherent value, theological value, that the mechanical miracle held already as a cultural technique and which these leaders then had a political interest in propagating and developing. So I've actually picked automata as the case study, which kind of brings both parts of that chapter together. Um, the earliest evidence for the use of automata in procession comes from Polybius's histories, and it describes the use of a self-animated snail, which led the procession of the great Dionysia in 309, 308, leaving a trail of slime behind as it went. Now, in Polybius's text, the weapon is we uh, the snail is weaponized as part of political slander against Demetrius, where his administration of the city is criticized through an explicit link to spectacle. Apparatus of choice is none other than a processional automaton. Now, the actual mechanisms of the scale of the snail is obscure, and there are various problems with how to power a machine automatically across this entire processional route. Um, However, even if the whole passage were simply uh, defamation against Demetrius, it remains pretty good evidence, I think, for the processional automaton being familiar enough for the literary trope to function. So that is, it's not so common that every leader could afford one, but frequent enough as a sort of spectacular treat that the audience understood the implications of the scientific knowledge and the resources that would have gone into the production and deployment of such a machine. Now, unlike the notorious case of Demetrius Polyorchetes and his ithophallic hymn shortly after, Demetrius of Phaleron never received religious cult, though apparently at the Dionysia a hymn was sung which equated him to the sun in some way. To go any further would have likely uh, been seen to contradict much of his moral and religious legisl legislation. But we do see the kind of seeds of Hellenistic ruler cult um, being planted here, right? For, for Demetrius of Phalerum, at least, the processional automaton was a useful tool to associate the human ruler with the divine prosperity that the city was experiencing under them without necessarily being so overt as establishing cult. In other words, hosting a religious festival in which impressive stage machinery reflected the presence and benevolence of the god was a convenient way to draw links between the notion of self-animated, spontaneous and bountiful as symbolised by the device and those same things as symbolized in the agency of the ruler, who's also unbound by these conventional limitations. Now, this idea takes a far less subtle turn in the next example, the grand procession of Ptolemy Philadelphus in Alexandria, where the Egyptian context made it far less controversial for the ruling monarch to equate himself directly with the divine. At some point in the 270s, Ptolemy uh, II organized what must have been one of the most lavish festivals in antiquity. The parade had at least a couple of technologically animated elements, a statue of Nisa, 12 feet high, who stood up with no one touching her, poured a libation and set back down again. This mechanism would could have had a couple of gears to transfer horizontal motion of the cart into vertical force acting on the statue. Next was a cave which poured uh, never in, from which poured never ending springs of milk and wine. And practically speaking, we could have used, for example, uh, the Archimedes screw. Now, during what should have been the most frugal time of the year, the pneumatic marvel of seeing never ending streams of liquid was a potent image of conspicuous consumption and a visual demonstration of the abundance of Dionysus and of Ptolemaic Alexandria. 
In its magnificence, the parade was both an invocation of Dionysian presence and a manifestation of the deity's forces at work. A call for the deity's attention, but also a response and an affirmation of the deity's presence. The use of the automata in the procession was particularly effective in visually manifesting this divine human um, call response. In a uh, Ptolemaic religious context where they existed both an Egyptian precedent for associating a monarch with a god and a Hellenic precedent for the category of mechanical epiphany, lavish self-animated spectacle machinery made it almost too easy to kind of manifest the cultic fusion and the equation between Alexandria and Ptolemy and Dionysus, between city, monarch and god. The third piece of evidence recording the use of processional automaton comes from the great Panathenia of 143 CE, where Herodotus Atticus is said to have organized a self-moving ship to make its way through the streets of Athens carrying the peplos. By the second century, the Panathenia had more, a history of more than 600 years, during which time developments had taken place in almost every area of the festival, the procession included. The automated ship seems to be a late invention, and appears to be working with existing traditions of the Panathenaeum. The peplos tapestry or sail had some relation to the known use of ship carts in ancient uh, religious procession. The ship cart seems to have been used at, uh, at the very least by the, fifth, the first century BC in the Panathenaeum, and is also a known feature much earlier of other Greek processions. Once more, then, we're pushed to look beyond the picture of the processional automaton as a kind of abrupt innovation that a few power-hungry individuals are, um, uh, as an abrupt innovation by a few power-hungry indiv individuals. And instead, we, we should try to contextualise mechanical processional equipment more broadly, noting the way that the use of ship carts in procession already predates and theologically anticipates the more complex automata that follow. Now, what the body of anecdotal evidence makes clear is the way that processional automata, at least from the examples that we have, uh, were associated with individual political leaders. That is certainly the case, Demetrius of Phalerum, Ptolemy II, Herodotus Atticus. Yet the individual circumstances that underlie each of these is quite distinct. So it probably isn't right to lump them all together, actually. The Ptolemaic case, uh, I think, is quite clear in Automata's ability to link and manifest this Ptolemaic, Alexandrian, Dionysian splendor. The Demetrian case is slightly more complicated in its politics, where there is, at least as we get it through Polybius, uh, a power play between spectacle as a sign of abundance and stability and spectacle as a needless waste of a kind of self-aggrandizing, though not quite divine, ruler. And the Herodian case is different again when we're in a second sophistic context and Athens's fifth century achievements and cultural capital is what's really being re-harnessed and re-performed um, and where the city's religious capital is actually integral to this mission. But if there are different political contexts that underlie each of the three um, cases that we have of the for the use of processional automata, we have seen that all um, have traditions of interaction between religion and mechanics that predate and anticipate them in certain ways. To this kind of anecdotal evidence, we can add um, our single surviving text on the construction of automata, that is Hero of Alexandria's first century manual. Um, now there's some beautiful re um, reconstructions of Hero's objects these days. So I encourage you, if this is interesting to you to have a look um, online. Hero basically presents two categories of automata in his work. The first are movable shrines or altars. And the second function is miniature theatres. Hero discusses in detail an example from each. So the shrine to Dionysus is on the left-hand side of the screen, and then the legend of Naplius, respectively. Now, there are no explicit comments in that text on the context of uses of the machine, but it still proves incredibly useful for the, for the topic at hand. From a history of science perspective, uh, Hero's text helps reveal a tradition of automata making, actually, which starts as early as the 3rd century BC, because Hero tells us as, at various points how he is improving a model of his predecessor, Philo of Byzantium. 
And in a way, this gives the skeptics the hard facts, actually, they need to reconstruct these machines. Hera's text also offers invaluable information about the function, the construction and the conception of the whole enterprise of automata building. The text is full of comments about ensuring that the machine runs smoothly, taking care that the size isn't too big so as not to arouse suspicion that someone's inside, how to keep the external presentation fresh and unique. At various points, Hera really stresses that the external presentation of the, of the machines he describes can differ and you should make sure that these are differing externally. Um, now, the example he chooses for the movable shrine is one to Dionysus. And Dionysus is actually the divinity that we um, get most often associated with automata and automation in antiquity. He's the kind of paradigmatic disturber of boundaries. Um, and the God also unsettles the boundary between animate and inanimate. Okay. Might quickly move on, just checking the time. We'll go to the, the final part now. So part three, faking the gods. There is also the possibility of a different dynamic between technology and religion, human and divine. And that is one of tension rather than cooperation. If humans can construct authentic avenues to the divine, the flip side of this is that these same avenues can be usurped um, for fraud. And this is a topic that is actually richly explored by a wide range of ancient authors. So although uh, the majority of this part is grounded in Lucianic satire, this is a conundrum that thanks to or perhaps because of Prometheus, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of idea that entered the, the Greek imagination from the beginning of the mythic tradition, really. Lucian's Alexander follows its eponymous protagonist back to the city of um, Abinatacus, where he manages to establish and propagate a cult of Glycon, which he hails as the new Asclepius. According to Lucian's text, the cult is a total scam, and the narrator aims to unmask all of the tricks of deceit which Alexander used to create and then to propagate the religiosity of the cult. On the basis of individuals named in the text, we can deduce that Alexander was active between 150 and 170 CE and that Lucian's text was written not long after that. Alexander, uh, Lucian's Alexander capitalizes on three commonplace concerns in ancient Greek religion. The first is the role of the human hand in the production of sacred icons. The second is the adaptability of the system to incorporate new gods. Now, neither of these features are new to this period, but the changing religious landscape through the introduction of lots of new cults at this time, um, from Isis and Mithras and imperial cult to Judaism and Christianity, was a germane issue for Lucian. Yet if they always existed and they would continue to exist, old-fashioned competition between cults and sanctuaries, the story of Alexander is also really symptomatic of an early Roman imperial world where there's another important feature at play and that is the rise of religious freelancers. Alexander is characterized by Lucian as a religious entrepreneur actively participating in spreading his religious product to a market that had a choice of other options. There are two main uses of mechanics in the cult of Glycon. The mechanically enhanced icon of the deity himself and the autophone to then deliver prophecies. Alexander first presents Neos Esclepios to the people of Abinatacus by fashioning an anthropomorphic painted and lifelike head made of linen, which he affixes to the body of a real serpent. The head has a mechanism which by horse hairs would allow the snake to open and close its mouth and to dart its tongue in and out. And it's stressed that worshippers could touch the manifestation of the god. Now, various elements of the epiphany um, are marvelous, according to Lucian. First, you know, the snake, uh, which was just born a few days prior, uh, was now a huge serpent. The, the, the snake had a human face and it was tame. And thirdly, the miracle was convincing precisely, according to Lucian, because Alexander allowed people to get close enough to touch the deity, which probably also meant they could see the mechanism or the open and shutting of the mouth. In other words, while nature usually determines a fixed rate of growth, this serpent grew unusually fast. 
while certain conventions existed for vi visual representations of the divine, this god has it had a completely peculiar icon iconography. Um, the mechanical epiphany of glycon was so successful because it contained so many elements that were parafusin that exceeded what nature was capable of without technical assistance. And as I mentioned briefly at the start of the presentation, parafusin uh, and its inverse catafusin is terminology which really lies at the heart of the technological's relation to miraculous in the technical corpus as well. So after the initial epiphany of the god, Alexander unveils a new and improved version of the snakehead, having developed it also into a talking device used to deliver oracles, the autophone. Lucian explains that Alexander had put a windpipe from a crane, um, attached that to the head of the snake. The development of the autophone had a very specific purpose, to produce further shock and enchantment in the crowd. This increased uh, shock which Alexander's technical edition prompts aligns directly with the explanation that Hero of Alexandria gives on the intended impact of automata on the viewer. In introducing his text, sorry, I don't know if I have a, I don't. In introducing his text, Hero says that the study of automaton making is worthwhile on two fronts. For the skill involved on the side of the maker and for the ekplexus, this very same word, that the spectacle engenders on the side of the viewer. Lucian, Lucian's Alexander, despite its satire, is utterly consistent, actually, with Hero's mechanical text in its presentation of the principles behind religious persuasion of mechanics. Now, since the beginning of the 20th century, the discovery of various pieces of evidence have corroborated Lucian's description of the glycon cult. And I've put some of those on the slide. I don't have time to kind of go in detail, so you have to trust me on this one. Um, the material evidence which offers the basis for the cult, the historical basis for the cult, is being used by scholars as a springboard to draw further conclusions regarding the cult's formation and propagation. The argument is that if the inhabitants of Abernathakis were willing to accept the new god, it wasn't because of their stupidity, as Lucian kind of frames it in his text, obviously, but it was because they were confronted with very familiar processes. These range from the way that Alexander dresses and tosses his hair and speaks in tongues and claims divine descent to the legion of, of cult personnel that he accrues and his use of torchlight and hymnody, the, the various ways that the cult packages together divination and healing and initiation. Um, this approach to understanding Alexander has provided lots of um, fruitful avenues, obviously, but the, the me mechanical component is always relegated to theatrics. It's, it's stripped of its capacity for genuine religious persuasion. In other words, the most striking element of the cult of Glycon um, and, and the way that he, he manifests his epiphanic presence and, and the way that he um, gives his oracular statements through this autophone is never actually taken seriously as a technique that would have enhanced the religious aura of the cult. Um, people assume that the technology was the fictional product of the, of the literary genre and part of the theatrical metaphors that are used in the text and nothing else. And this comes from a, a lack of integration of the evidence for technological epiphanies into the picture we have of ancient religion. And, and it probably also stems from kind of Protestant sensibilities where spirit is privileged over matter, uh, theatricality is disavowed, and which constantly tends to resist any connections between technique and the divine. And actually, this is an attitude that we get already in our early Christian texts that explicitly denounce the combination of mechanics and religion as fraudulent. So we have an early third century text by Hippolytus of Rome called The Refutation of All Heresies, and it provides some of the best examples for the use of technologies for effect, um, religious effect in pagan religion in general, and actually specifically corroborates Lucian's description of the Glycon cult in various ways. Um, but of course, Hippolytus's account doesn't guarantee the historicity of the cult of Glycon or of Alexander's actions. And that's not really what I'm trying to say with, with talking about um, Hippolytus, but what the refutation of all heresies does allow is for us to broaden out the picture of the phenomenon at stake, but beyond the confines of Lucianic fictions. Okay, I'll wrap up because it's been a long talk already. So in conclusion, the technologies of the marvelous uh, serves on its most basic level as a collation of evidence that attests 
reference to the overlapping of mechanics and religion in the ancient world. Simply to document the examples would I think have been to sell the, the topic a bit short. Faced with these examples, I've then attempted to think about how technologies, mechanical objects, knowledges and process, processes were used to create and to authenticate theological truths in ancient Greek religion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can either use the raise hand feature or just unmute yourself. Can't see everyone at one go. <laughs> Is there any evidence that, that Judaism used this type of technology? I was thinking about the ark as you was talking, or um, any other this type of artifact. Yeah, this is a good question. I haven't looked massive amounts into it, but what I have come across is, for example, in the letter to Aristias, um, you get kind of temple complexes that use technologies. I think it's something to do with water. Um, so yes, I think I think there's actually a really a, a lot of interesting work to be done there. Um, Will that's a great kind of avenue, and not least in the fact that my my PhD focuses just on one. I mean, we could we could expand this out to Roman religion really, um, and talk about this in different ways. Um, so yeah, I think I think there definitely would be. And what would be interesting then is to see the what the different ways that the different theological underpinnings of those religions interact with mechanical traditions in different ways. Um, yeah. When will the book be published? Oh, it's a great question. Um, a year, give me a year, 18 months. <laughs> it's in the final, it's in its final moments, but these things always take longer than, than one anticipates. Um, so hopefully soon. But Good. if, you know, if you're working on something that's of interest, I'm really happy, just get in touch and we can, you know, exchange and, and, and chat and that's totally fine. How did you get into this area of study? Oh, that's a that's a nice question. Um, so I I have to say I'm indebted to wonderful teachers that I had. So in Sydney, I worked with Eric Sharpo, who um, works, as I'm sure many of you know, on on theatre, the history of theatre. And he was the one who said to me, you know, there's something here um, about automata that is beyond what people have already written. So automata were often written about from a kind of history of science perspective on what the mechanisms could tell us about our own modern inventions. Typically, Hero gets called the inventor of the steam engine, um, these, these kinds of comments, and, and sort of recontextualizing Hero's inventions in the culture that, that created them was the kind of idea that I got from, from Eric's prompting. Um, and then, so that was my MPhil topic was on, on automata, just on automata. And then from there, as I was researching for my MPhil, I sort of realized there was there was loads that the topic could unpack further. Um, and that that formed the basis of my of my PhD. Um, yeah, and I have to say, as well as live teachers in the flesh. Um, so I, you know, you, you feel like, I feel like maybe this is a completely loony thing to say. I also feel like I have surrogate teachers through the books that I read. And I got very into Serafina Kuomo's books. You know, she was in the UK, I was in Australia, but I just, I read every book that she had written. And I just, yeah, I learned a lot from, of, of the ancient maths and technical side from, from reading her and kind of, yeah, tried to cobble things together as best I could. Yeah. Uh, Kiaren, uh, do you have a question? Oh, uh, yes, I have. Um, earlier, you mentioned that the that there wasn't as much of a distinction as we might think between what we'd consider like technology, uh, hard engineering, and science, and what they'd consider to be arts. Um, is there any distinction at all between what's like the more abstract flowery things like euphony and uh, just like good looking things and aesthetics that they did have in any sort of way? Thank you. It's a good question. Um, I think there are. I think 
I think I try to do two things, which is to, to point out the overlaps, I think, so that we can bring our ancient technology into a dialogue about culture, in, into dialogue with cultural topics, okay, so that they don't stand outside by themselves. But in saying that, I do recognize that there are differences. And I think that's what I try to, that's why I find that the, the, the notion of the epistemic thing quite uh, useful for me to answer that. So I do think that there is a difference. I do think that art objects um, and mechanical objects are kind of Venn diagrams where there is significant overlap but there are distinctions on either side and um, the the distinction on the kind of mechanical object side is that capacity for the mechanical object to demonstrate scientific principles in a way that that art doesn't always um, and does that make sense uh, I'm not an art historian so I won't attempt to speak for art but I'll, I'll speak for mechanical objects <laughs> it makes perfect sense Um, a, oh, go ahead. I'll just send. I put a question in, in the chat. You made allusions oh. to Alexandria. Are they? Have you found any other evidence of, of other cultures that the um, Greeks might have borrowed their science or tech they from? Yeah, absolutely. The Greeks were totally in, indebted in in loads of way to Eastern cultures in terms of their science and their tech, in terms of the knowledge that goes into these things, okay? We think of the the crane, the mechanical crane that I was talking about. I mean, this is in the, uh, the mechane, the theatrical mechane, indebted to the shadoof, like the earliest forms of, of water lifting devices that we know. Absolutely. There is no doubt about that. Then I think what my interest is in how uh, the religious, the, the, the theological peculiarities of the system into which this scientific content is kind of dropped is, is, is reinterpreted. Does that make sense? So yes, there is, there are massive amounts of cultural contact and of indebtedness um, in terms of purely the knowledge. And, and my interest is the interaction between the knowledge and the religious system into which it gets, it gets kind of, um, yeah, popped into. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Thanks, Will. I'll also take questions about coming to Australia if you want. Just kidding, but you should all come. Come and visit us. Oh, there are some hands now. Yes, uh, uh, may, may I jump in here? Uh, fascinating talk, uh, Tatiana, and thank you for that. But is it too dangerous to, to simplify it to this extent? It seems like you're, you're sort of saying, um, like if I, I'm in the back of my mind is this line from Ovid that good art will hide art. Um, but you seem to want to say that the techne and the mechanics supporting it, we want to show it all like, 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 like in today, instead of just showing the finished product, we show how to get there. We show all the sort of missteps and, and, um, Mechan like the mechanical details. And so that is, 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 is that too much of an oversimplification? You're trying to say, here's the result, the epiphany, and here's the mechanics that support it. And you need to sort of see how both are working together. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I see how it, it comes across as an oversimplification. If you put a monograph into a, into a heart, into a 40 minute talk, for sure. Um, and I hope that the book is more, um, Kind of nuanced in the way that I unpack that. I don't try to claim that in every instance that there needs to be a kind of pulling away of the smoke and mirrors for the miracle to work. Absolutely not. But what I'm saying is that those two things are not mutually exclusive, that there also can be a sense of miraculous, even if you see the, the techniques at play. And that goes for art. Ovid is just one voice that goes for art in the same way that that goes for mechanical objects and miraculous contexts of viewing technologies. Um, in, in what your comment about Ovid is, is a good one. So one of the problems with attacking this topic is viewership is how do we, how do we get, how do we understand what, what their viewership experience was? Okay. And so for the theatrical mechanic, there's a really obvious answer. Aristotle, Aristotle tells us what it's like to view the crane and he doesn't like it at all. And he says, it's, you know, he basically argues against me, right? He says that it's a dodgy piece of equipment and, and that the Medea of, of all the plays and Medea does it the worst. 
right? And so there is something to be said, I think, of saying there are ancient voices that we then need to consider and think about whether actually they are representative of the whole. I don't think that Aristotle's poetics is representative of the whole uh, when it comes to viewing the mechanae of, of, of experiencing tragedy. Um, and and I don't think that that statement of Ovid's is representative of the whole when it comes to ancient art either. I, I think um, that there are lots of, and you know, wonderful art historians and classicists like people like Verity Platt have shown the way that actually, um, especially in Hellenistic art, for example, um, that, that that constructedness is also part of the viewing process for, for artworks. Um, so I hope it didn't come across as too simplistic. Oh, no. You're right that I need to be careful. But um, I suppose it's kind of um, hammering my point for, for that in order to, to kind of prove it and then maybe we can tone it down a no, bit. No, 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 my, 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 that, that wasn't the intent of my question. My thought, I, I was worried um, that I was oversimplifying, but what, what I really liked about your talk is this sense that the, that the, that seeing the way that the mechanae fit in with the epiphany and the ambiguity so that you, so it, in, in some instances it, it works to, let's say, highlight uh, devotion in some of those processionals and you see this wonderful mechanical thing and you know who knows how the, exactly how the audience was moved but then with somebody like Lucian the mechanae becomes a road for skepticism to be suspicious of the epiphany as a result I just I, I just thought it was a it was a it was a, mm -hmm. a very it, it's something I've struggled with to try to sort of piece these things together so you really helped me oh, clarify thank you. my own thinking so thank you Thank you. And I guess we get more clues about viewership as well in Hero, right? If Hero is the one who's making the machines or who's telling people how to make the machines and considering that you want to make sure it's smooth, that you want to make sure that it comes across a particular way to your viewers, to me, that means just as much, if not more, than the Aristotelian kind of theoretical comment. Um, so I guess it's this sense of when I first came to this topic a long time ago, it there was this real sense that automata were just, you know, that, that I mean, I'm going to simplify again, but that the Greeks were dumb. They didn't know what they were seeing and that's why they were inspired and in awe of it, right? And I guess I'm trying to say you don't have to be dumb and, and not understand a mechanism to be in awe of a mechanism. I mean, we in this day and age are in awe of lots of mechanisms, even if we can say, oh, I see that that is some kind of technological thing and, and I assume that there's an engineering explanation for it, but I can still be impressed and I can still, you know, this can still um, elicit somatic and cognitive and emotional and possibly religious responses in me through this. So I guess it's also kind of, yeah, trying to fight this, this notion of um, uh, the naive viewer, you know, and then that leading to the miracle and that being the only way that a miraculous response can be in, uh, invoked in the viewer. Um, yes, but yeah. yes but I, I also see if you extended the topic beyond just mechanae, like if you look at the way... Um, uh, artisans, like the, the 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 point that Socrates ma makes over and over again, they have a knowledge and a know-how about things that other people they can see, like you know, the cobbler sees a flaw in a shoe, or you know, th those sorts of things. They have a they have a perceptive ability that you don't get unless you master the techne and things like that. It has it has quite a broad reach, which I really enjoy too. Thank you. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think we we can think about other techni in this way. Medicine is a good example. Medicine verges on kind of you know witchcraft or whatever it is because you don't necessarily know the techni to its ex certain level of expertise. And actually, Lucian's Alexander plays into that. So Alexander is supposed to be a really good healer, and there is this bizarre moment where Lucian's like. Mm, but actually, that's not that fraudulent because people have genuinely been healed by these new remedies that he's made, right? So there is a real fine line between yes. between knowledge and techne and um, fraud and, um, yeah, yeah, no. and, you know, religion. And I guess that's, yeah, th those kind of modalities are, are the interesting things to trace, to trace for me. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Carolina, do you have a question? Yes. So sorry for the, my question sort of shifts a little, but you mentioned uh, mathematics uh, briefly at the beginning and throughout the presentation. And I was wondering how much mathematics comes up in your research and how much of 
the explanations that you found um, in the text explaining that technologies sort of integrate um, mathematics? Uh, it's a good question. So I think um, the practitioners of, of mathematics and the practitioners of mechanics are slightly, uh, you know, different categories in, in antiquity, but we have um, a very late mathematician called Pappas of Alexandria, who usefully gives us a kind of description, a breakdown of all the different, um, let's say, like subcategories of how mathematical knowledge can be used. And that's where we learn a little bit more about the mechanical um, sub-branch and things like that. So I don't work loads on mathematics proper, but I uh, those texts can be useful to get little um, pieces of information about the broader cultural uh, context of scientific and engineering and mathematical enterprises in antiquity. Does that make sense? But I'm certainly not a historian of mathematics. Um, as I said, sorry, I keep plugging it, but Serafina Kuomo is, uh, you know, a, a wonderful author on ancient maths that um, if, if that's your interest. Um, do we have any further questions? If not, um, I'll just mention quickly, um, and th I'll thank you again, uh, Dr. Tatiana Burr. Um, I'll mention thank quickly you. that we are having a conference. Um, the Living Latin in New York City conference will take place um, September. Uh, February 17th to 18th uh, this coming winter. And the theme for that conference is technology and in antiquity. Um, it will feature talks in English, Latin, and ancient Greek. And we are currently accepting abstract proposals for the conference. Um, registration will open in November. And the link was just put in the chat. So thanks, everyone. Um, I hope thank everyone you everyone for coming. Hope you have a good night. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.